Today's scripture is Mark 8, verses 8 through 18. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Delmetha. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly I tell you, no sign will be given it. Then he left them, got back in the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not, are you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. I think you may be seated. Thank you, Kathy. Let's pray. Father, one more prayer just to say, take this moment especially when we look into your word and your word looks into us and deal with each individual heart here, Lord, as only you can do. Speak to us what we need to hear as a person. I believe you have that in mind for every person here. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a children's book character by Peggy Parrish named Amelia Bedelia. Anybody familiar with Amelia Bedelia? Okay. Well, uh, she's a housekeeper, and she is a real literalist when it comes to communication, which leads to this never-ending confusion and comedy. So when she's instructed to prune the hedges, she goes and gets some prunes and ties them to the hedges. Uh, when she's told to weed the garden, she plants weeds among the vegetables. And she tells them, you need to know the difference between weeding and unweeding. Okay? And then the surprise shower for the neighborhood culminates in Amelia's soaking all of the guests with the garden hose. Well, we smile at that kind of antics, which are humorous because of, their, of her inability to understand nuances in human language. She hears the words, but she's so literal that she doesn't catch the underlying meaning. Well, that's what we just read about in Mark's Gospel reading, a striking similarity between Amelia Bedelia and the disciples of Jesus. In Mark 8, we find the disciples having their own difficulty understanding Jesus' words to them precisely because they take one of his words too literally. Jesus says yeast, and they think bread. And it's really ironic that the disciples are worried about having enough bread at this point in Mark's gospel. I mean, they've already seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. For you mathematicians out there, that's 1,000 people per loaf of bread. And right before this story, we read another story of Jesus had fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. Now, that's a little harder, but that's roughly 570 people per loaf. So here are the 12 of them in a boat with one loaf of bread and this same Jesus on board the boat worried about whether they will have enough to eat for lunch. It would seem the odds are in their favor. And so Jesus seems to throw up His hands in verses 17 and 18. Did you notice that? He said, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts Harden, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? 
I mean, Jesus is totally exasperated. He's basically saying, don't you guys get it yet? And when we remember that these guys have been with him for quite a while and experienced some pretty amazing things, we can understand why Jesus is amazed at their lack of understanding. And it's true that at times in Mark's Gospel, they seem to be more like the twelve stooges than the twelve disciples. You know, uh, you don't see it much anymore, but many products used to come with the slogan, Satisfaction Guarantee. Maybe they quit using that phrase because they were encountering more and more people who weren't satisfied. But think with me for a moment. What can bring satisfaction in people's lives? What, here we are in a church. What can bring satisfaction in people's lives? Do you think you know the answer? I've used this story before. and Some of you have heard it, but it's so good. Children's church. All the children down front. The pastor's trying to get the children involved. He says, I want, boys and girls, I'm thinking of something that's small and gray and furry and gathers nuts in the winter. And a little boy sheepishly laid his head, yes, Jimmy, what, what's the answer? He said, well, pastor, I know the answer's supposed to be Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. <laughs> <laughs> we think we know the answer. There was a Christian course written many years ago called, Only Jesus Can Satisfy Your Soul. Now that's true. But I want you to hear this morning, even with Jesus, satisfaction is not guaranteed. Before you label me a heretic, let me show you scripturally why that is an accurate statement. So once again, here's the basic premise for this sermon. Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. But even with Jesus, Satisfaction is not guaranteed. We started our reading this morning in Mark chapter 8, uh, verse 8. And Jesus had just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread, which we've already mentioned. And here's what Mark said about that. The people ate and were satisfied. But not everyone who encountered Jesus while He walked this earth was satisfied, including the disciples. Jesus' is closest friends. I want to ask you this morning, think about this. Have you become dissatisfied in your Christian life? If, you, if you're not dissatisfied right now, can you remember a time in your life where you did become dissatisfied? Maybe you kind of walked away for a while, or you certainly didn't have the answers and you were dissatisfied. If you haven't experienced that, I know you have family members, maybe people you know that used to be strong Christians were walking the walk, walking the faith journey, and they got dissatisfied and they're not walking that walk. And I want you to know, as we look at this story in Mark this morning, I think these three reasons pretty well encapsulate the reasons why people sometimes become dissatisfied with Jesus even. So let's look at them. The first one is this. Satisfaction is not guaranteed when expectations exceed reality. In between Jesus feeding the 4,000 people, he and his disciples got on a boat, a boat as we read, he, and he has a short encounter, before, before they get on the boat, he has a short encounter with the Pharisees, remember? His bitter enemies. Now we would certainly expect them to not be satisfied with Jesus. And they didn't seem to ever be satisfied with anybody or anything outside of themselves. Here's what Mark told us. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test Him, they asked Him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. See, it, it, it didn't matter what Jesus did. It was never enough for the Pharisees. I mean, He'd just given them a sign feeding 4,000 people with very limited resources. Whenever Jesus gave them a sign, they still refused to believe. Whether it was healing a man who was born blind or restoring a man's withered hand to wholeness on the Sabbath, the Pharisees' expectations of Jesus always exceeded reality. Always wanted. How about you this morning? 
How has your experience of the Christian life been? Were you expecting things to get better when you came to Christ in faith? And instead they got worse? Were you expecting things to get easier and instead they got much harder? Do you feel like Jesus somehow didn't keep His end of the bargain when you gave your life to Him? See, if we're honest, most of us are like Lucy in the Peanuts cartoon who said, I don't want ups and downs. I want ups and ups and ups. That's just true about life in general. I mean, we get dissatisfied just in the regular things of life. You see a picture of a food item from a fast food restaurant and it looks so full and so fresh and so delicious. So you go and order it at the counter and it comes out so flat and so wilted and so unappealing. Our expectations exceed reality. I mean, they always look, make it look a lot better than it actually is. But, but here's the thing. Jesus doesn't give us any illusions like that. Your Christian walk hasn't turned out the way you thought it was going to? Let me share two quick thoughts with you. They're in your outline there. A man worked a construction job. It's time for lunch. He's sitting next to his friend. He pulls out his brown bag. He reaches in. He pulls out the sandwich. He goes, a bologna sandwich again. I hate bologna sandwiches. And his friend says, well, why don't you tell your wife to fix you something else? He said, wife, I fix my own lunches. <laughs> Here's the rock bottom truth. We are responsible for a lot of the baloney in our life. We want to blame God. We want to make Him, uh, we want Him to make our life easier and better. But we are responsible for the choices we make. And secondly, who said the Christian life was supposed to be easy? We were never promised that. Jesus never promised that. The Bible doesn't promise that. If anything, it proclaims the exact opposite. A life of faith will almost always cost you something. It may cost you a great deal. Jesus said, if any person would come after me, let him deny himself daily, take up his cross, and follow me. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a picnic. So what you expect and what reality actually is may set you up for disappointment, for being dissatisfied. When expectations exceed reality. There is a second reason in this passage that satisfaction with Jesus is not guaranteed. Satisfaction is not guaranteed when we focus on external circumstances instead of internal resources. Look again, verses 14 through 16. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. As we already mentioned, this is incredible. The disciples had just seen Jesus feed 4,000 people with just a few loaves of bread. There are 12 of them, and they look down to see they only have one loaf of bread, and they panic. We're going to starve. What are we going to do? And their problem was focusing on the externals instead of what God wanted to do in their lives internally. They had resources available to them on the inside, but they were obsessing on the lack of material things on the outside. They just had one loaf. Even as Christians, even as followers of Jesus, like these disciples, we have a tendency to get things backward in the Christian life. I hope you'll listen to this. If we're not careful, we let our circumstances determine how we think and feel about God and what we need to do is let what we know and trust about God through faith determine 
how we think and feel about our circumstances. Let me say it this way. Don't let your circumstances determine how you feel about God, but let what you know about God through faith determine how you deal with your circumstances. Get your focus off of your external circumstances and onto the internal resources that God has given you. But there's one last way we set ourselves up for spiritual disappointment. One more way we can become dissatisfied with Jesus. Satisfaction is not guaranteed when we experience spiritual amnesia. Once again, let's look at those questions Jesus asked in verses 17 and 18. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? They just didn't get it. As you're reading through the Gospels, do you ever wonder how Jesus put up with these guys? We've already mentioned that. Doesn't this seem almost ludicrous? I mean, it's not like it's been a year or a month or even a week since Jesus fed the 4,000 people with a few loaves of bread. I mean, it just happened. So we're inclined to think, what a bunch of dummies. You know, maybe they needed one of those books, Discipleship for Dummies. Okay. Then if we're honest, we have to ask ourselves this question. Why does Jesus put up with me? Why does Jesus put up with us? We're the same way. Jesus comes to each and every one of us in the dissatisfactions of our own lives. No matter what we're going through, no matter what failures we've had recently in our lives, and He says, don't you... I've shared with you before, both in a sermon and as a, 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 a communion meditation, this quote, but it's so appropriate to what I'm saying. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time from Paul Turnier, a Christian psychologist who had counseled many, many people over many, many years. And after all those years of hearing people's countless problems, he summed it all up this way. The problem with most people is they remember what they should forget, and they forget what they should remember. That's powerful if you think of it. That is so true. In our Christian life, we're not careful. We remember every failure, every sin, every shameful act, every time we disappointed or hurt those people that we love. And even though we confessed it, even though we repented of it, we asked God's forgiveness, we still remember. And we forget the goodness of God. How He brought us through an incredibly difficult time. How He delivered us during times of temptation. How He answered our prayers when we were completely out of any human resources. How He brought healing and wholeness and forgiveness and deliverance out of hopeless circumstances. When we don't remember, when we get bogged down in the failures of our past, when we get into shame or regrets and the disappointments with life, we can continue to make choices in the present that can set us up for even more failure in the future. You know, I love to read the book of Psalms. Do you 150 of them? It's interesting when you go through the Psalms, three times in the book of Psalms, the psalmist wrote a particular heading. It said this, a psalm to bring to remembrance. Why? Because the people of God had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten how God had delivered them in the past. And they needed to remember. Don't forget what you should remember. 
Do you want to experience deep satisfaction in your life? I want to tell you this. You can only find it in Jesus. But just remember, don't let the expectations of the Christian life exceed the reality of what Jesus has promised. I mean, I truly believe, I know it's true, you can find real happiness and joy in a relationship with Jesus, but I also believe God's deepest desire for you is not to make you happy, but to make you holy. Whatever that cost. The Bible tells us God wants to conform you to the image of His Son. He wants to make you more like Jesus. That's a good thing. But it also might be a painful thing. Focus on your internal resources, not your external problem. The Bible says, greater is He that's in you than He or anything that's out in this world. And finally, remember the right things, not the wrong things. Let go of your disappointments and failures in the past. Remember how God has been faithful to you all the way through. And He is always the same. But His mercy are new. Father, thank You for the way You speak to us in Your Word. Thank You for all the incredibly wonderful stories, especially when we get into the Gospel stories about Your Son. He was on this earth. And what we can glean from that, it's true. True for our hearts, true for our lives. And I pray, Lord, somebody here, maybe all of us here, heard a word that was specifically for us. Something in today's message, Lord, I pray, touch to every heart. And help us to know that if we're dissatisfied with you, it's not your fault. It's because we have some sort of misconception in our mind. You are the only one who can satisfy us. So help us come to you. Not look for it in other things, other circumstances that will only enslave us, really, and can never truly satisfy us. Because you are the In Jesus' name we pray.